This is the International Anthony Burgess Foundation podcast. Anthony Burgess was one of the most important and prolific British writers of the 20th century. Most famous for his dystopian vision, A Clockwork Orange, he wrote 33 novels, 25 books of non-fiction, and over 250 musical compositions. This podcast aims to illuminate Burgess's life and work, and his connections to other 20th century literature, film and music. So join us as we explore the world of Anthony Burgess. In this episode we're exploring the making of the new documentary film A Clockwork Orange The Prophecy with the directors Elisa Montan and Benoit Felici. A Clockwork Orange The Prophecy is the first new documentary to focus on Burgess since the Burgess Variations in 1999. Drawing on archival footage, startling new animations and interviews with major cultural figures, this documentary reconsiders the 60-year history of A Clockwork Orange as a novel, film, stage play and cultural influence. The filmmakers also worked in the archive at the Burgess Foundation and used images of Burgess's home city of Manchester to tell their story. The interviews that the film contains are with an international cast of artists, writers, musicians and experts, including Will Self, Ai Weiwei and Campino, the lead singer of the German punk band Die Totenhosen. These different perspectives offer new insights into A Clockwork Orange and its legacy. A Clockwork Orange The Prophecy is directed by Elisa Montan and Benoit Felici for Arte, the pan-European public service channel dedicated to cultural programming. It's currently available at Arte's website in French, German and Spanish. It's our hope that the English language version of the film will soon find a distributor in the UK and the USA. Elisa Montan has been making television documentaries for more than 30 years. Her previous subjects include Salman Rushdie, John Berger, Robert Saviano and Colette. In 1997, she directed a 45-minute programme about Anthony Burgess for French television. She's an honorary patron of the Burgess Foundation. Benoit Felici's previous films include Unfinished Italy, an exploration of Italy's modern-day ruins, The Real Thing, a film about architectural replicas of national monuments around the world, and a film about the Italian painter Giuseppe Archimboldo, famous for his portraits consisting of vegetables and other inanimate objects. Here's Andrew Biswell, who spoke to Elisa Montan and Benoit Felici, ahead of the English-language premiere of A Clockwork Orange, The Prophecy at the Burgess Foundation in January 2024. It's a pleasure to welcome Elisa Montin and Benoit Felici to the podcast. We're very much looking forward to the first screening of the English version of your documentary later on this evening, and we're grateful for this opportunity to sit down with both of you and ask a few questions about the film. Well, first of all, how would you introduce your film to somebody who hadn't seen it? The film tells the story of A Clockwork Orange and actually it tells the story of the discovery of a new manuscript that has been found a few years ago by the Anthony Burgess Foundation in his house in Italy. It's a pretty mysterious manuscript because it is made of... uh, text in which it tries to, uh, Anthony Burgess tries to explain why he made that, that book and he tried to justify himself about against the accusation he receives from uh, all over the parts, by the way, uh, right after the film has been released. And uh, Anthony Burgess was uh, accused to be the father of violence And, of course, his intention was not to create violence, but to reflect about violence. So the films try to explore this new manuscript, which is made out of collage of articles and texts and reflections, philosophical reflections about the society and and violence and uh, manipulations and medias. And we tried to uh, confront this manuscript, the clockwork condition, with the clockwork orange. It's very unusual, I think, to have a manuscript, an unpublished manuscript, uh, kind of at the centre of a story. There's obviously a much bigger story, but 
maybe we could say something about the the challenges and the difficulties of of proceeding from an archive which has printed paper and manuscripts and photographs to building a story, a bigger story, about Burgess and the clockwork orange and the clockwork condition? Well, certainly it was a challenge because uh, in terms of the film, we already had to explore. We wanted to show, um, to put the text at the forefront. So we needed, obviously, to use extracts of A Clockwork Orange and extracts of the novel. Um, And then, of course, the fact that uh, we were allowed and the foundation gave us the permission to use the the manuscript, I mean, of this novel, The, the manuscript of this text, because it's a very strange text. The fact that it's not complete, and of course he changes his style, changes his perspective as well, from a philosophical discussion to something which is much more personal. So all this was already complex. And then, in terms of film, the complexity was to wave in the two elements, the text and the manuscript. Now, it's difficult to explain why it's so, you know, it's I'm sure from the outside you think, well, what's the problem? But yeah, it was a question of voices, because we also wanted Burgess to speak. So we had the voice of the Burgess, we had the voice of the manuscript, and we had the voice of the text. How did you decide on the structure and the approach to the material? I mean, it's a very complex interplay of location filming and interviews and archive footage and animations and music. So th- there's, a lot, th- there's a lot going on. There's so many different elements I- in play. So I wonder how the, the structure and the story emerged from that very complex material. The film follows the story of A Clockwork Orange, but it tries to explore the different dimensions which are hidden inside the text. We use uh, animation, to tell the story. We use archive material of Anthony Burgess talking and explaining and justifying himself. And we use the manuscript, The Clockwork Condition, as a kind of uh, intimate reflection, secret reflection of Anthony Burgess that tells us what's what is in his mind. What was important, I think, was to also show the contemporary element of Clockwork Orange, how it uh, bounced back, if you like. And uh, yes, the structure is not something which was... Obviously, there was a structure at the beginning and a structure that we proposed to the channel. But that got, you know, changed as the edit went on and obviously evolved. Um, it's quite mysterious the work of editing, and once you start the beginning of the film, there is a logic which takes over. But the idea was very much to, to be able to show also how contemporary the novel was and how it was reflected in contemporary issues today, and that's through Ai Weiwei, uh, who participated in the film. Each interview, each interviewee, it seems to me, brings different elements to the story. Maybe you could just take us through some of them and and say more about that, what, what particular uh, kinds of expertise you drew on through these interviews. Well, first of all, obviously, Andrew, you as the biographer, uh, you were key in the film because you were the biographer and you are the biographer of Anthony Burgess. And, of course, that was important because we had to retrace some element of his life and and all the material and the novel and the content. And then we brought in people like uh, Alexandra Spencer-Jones. Of course, what was interesting about Alexandra is that she, uh, she put on this play of Burgess and the play was done by a young cast of actors, that he was on tour for two years. So that was obviously, and she was a woman, 
And I was very perplexed by the fact that why was a woman theatre director interested in Clockwork Orange? One element which was important to me and to try to understand was the music element about why was the underground and the pop music culture so fascinated by Clockwork Orange. And it was very much a discovery and trying to understand it. And so that's why we interviewed uh, Andrew Oldham and then Campino from the German group uh, Tutenhosen to make that link with the, the punk music scene, well, in this case, Germany, um, the Rolling Stone. And of course, what's interesting about it is the fact that they got interested in the novel and not so much in Kubrick's film. Then we, then, uh, of course, Enki Bilal, not of course, but Enki Bilal, who is a French uh, cartoonist, a science fiction cartoonist. And of course, there is the science fiction element of Clockwork Orange. So that was an element that we wanted to represent. And also, Enki Bilal grew up in ex Yugoslavia. And as a French participant, he could understand the language. And uh, we, ha we interviewed also an artist, a Chinese artist, which is called Ai Weiwei, who experienced in the real world, in real life, a similar experience that Alex is, is living in the book. So we wanted to explore how much the book was not only prophetic, but also something that can happen and uh, what Anthony Burgess was trying to, to tell us with his book. It's very um, notable in the film. You've got, uh, you've got French artists, you've got German musicians, you've got your Chinese artists. And that gets me thinking about the international dimension um, and resonance of the Clockwork Orange novel. Why do you think it's so important on that international level? I think A Clockwork Orange is a very universal story and uh, it doesn't talk only about uh, British culture or uh, American culture, but it also talks about youth, about the danger of new technologies or, or danger of how strong powers could use new technologies against our own free will. So in that sense, the topic of A Clockwork Orange uh, is universal. Very interestingly, I think, there's no voiceover, there's no narrator in your film. The voices and the story emerge more organically um, through the interviews and through the music and through the animation. And I think that that's quite unusual, quite untraditional with documentary. Maybe you could tell us more about that. Yeah, usually documentaries, and especially TV documentaries, uh, use a voiceover and a commentator who explains from above. And we wanted to have a more character-driven style in which Anthony Burgess is telling us his uh, thoughts and his feelings. Another dimension of it is also given by different uh, participants, as uh, you, Andrew Biswell, or other people who very uh, who knows uh, um, Anthony Burgess uh, very well, and who managed to give an emotional dimension, in the sense that we wanted to get into not only into the brains of Anthony Burgess, but also in his feelings and uh, the uh, difficulties and traumas he had in his life, who could explain the different reasons why he uh, wrote the book. So we wanted to get more into emotions, and uh, that was a uh, uh, possibility. Yeah. Maybe for people who've not seen it, you could tell us what the animations are doing and what you think they contribute to the, the overall composition. I think one of the main issues we had making this documentary film was that when you talk to someone about Clockwork Orange, everyone has in his mind the face of uh, Malcolm McDowell because everyone has 
the, the film in mind. And as we wanted to focus on the book, on the novel, we had to find new images, a new element to give to our audience to imagine the story. And animation was for us a good opportunity because it fits to the more cartoon uh, atmosphere of the book. It is less realistic uh, because it's uh, made out of drawings and Alex has not a, a prop, it has a human face, but it's, it's a drawing. So you can have more distance with the violence he's mm, doing, he's making. So animation was uh, helping us to, to take some distance with the Kubrick film but also to uh, give another image, to print a new image of A Clockwork Orange for our audience, for the audience of, of the documentary. And it's very refreshing to see you moving away from that Kubrick iconography, which is so familiar. And going back to the book, because what the droogs are wearing, the costumes in the animations are taken directly from the novel. So it's a much more uh, sort of faithful adaptation of the Burgess text, I think. We wanted to, to, to fit to, to the novel, to the, to, to the details uh, written in, in the novel, like the, the dress code, but also the, the cartoon animation gave us the opportunity to put into pictures something which was close to the Natsat language, which is more surrealistic and, uh, and less realistic. So this was, uh, and I have to say that uh, I'm not, and it is, uh, we are not uh, Kubrick, and we didn't have the, the, the money to make uh, such uh, productions. So animation was a very import important work, but it helps a lot to, uh, to fit to the book. Manchester is a very strong presence in your film almost, I'd say, one of the characters. I, I should point out, in case anyone hasn't seen it, that the, there are these um, brilliant sequences filmed on a wet Saturday night in November with the neon signs sort of glowing uh, off the wet streets uh, and it's young people going out and, and doing all, all kinds of things, going to bars and there are some young people riding motorbikes quite dangerously around. There is a sense of threat and menace, I think. Uh, as well as the beauty and the, the architecture of the city, bits of it that Burgess would have known and the, the modern buildings which he would not have known. Um, but uh, for me, this is one of the great strengths of the film are those images of Manchester today, which makes the continuity with a novel written 60 years ago and makes the viewer think about the contemporary resonances which are there. Um, so that's, that, that's very, actually very moving uh, to see those sequences about the city I you mean to sorry you mean to bring him back home it, it ha does have that effect yes it, the, the the footage of manchester today does bring bring the novel home and bring bring burgess home in some ways he says that in his writing and in the is it the autobiography where he says um and also in the manuscript uh, where he says it's a compound, uh, if you think of the city of Clockwork Orange, it's a compound of New York, uh, Russian city, and Manchester. So these are the three cities that he has got in mind. It was actually very fun to shoot in Manchester. First of all, because it was... Uh, November, very uh, windy and wet atmosphere. We tried to film during the day, but when it was night, we saw many young people getting to the bars and uh, shouting and having fun. And especially because Manchester is also a city full of music and concerts, locals and bars, you can also see people dressing up in a very particular way. And it's very fun. It was very inspiring to, to find all these elements that was uh, remembering some parts of, of, clock, of A Clockwork Orange and what probably inspired 
Anthony Burgess when he was writing it uh, about uh, in the 1960s. I have to say that I didn't really know Manchester. We didn't. Re uh, Elisa knew it, I think, but I didn't really know it, and I was very surprised and and um, and amazed by the combination of the industrial architecture with these uh, bricks, uh, orange uh, bricks, and modern architecture. And there is a very particular atmosphere that could re remember a kind of a dystopian atmosphere. You don't really know when we are, and it could be in the future, uh, especially with uh, high buildings with the lights and uh, coming out of the windows and we you don't know who is living there and there is this kind of anonymous atmosphere and this was very inspiring mm. i think those images are very well found and well utilized in the film for example the guilty bar in the northern quarter ties in with what the novel is saying about sin and crime and so forth that that was a great discovery a gift for you as a filmmaker i'm sure it was a great gift because we try to use as much as possible the elements we were finding in the street like for example the uh, not only the graffitis but also the murales the, the paintings on the walls and uh, street art that is mixing forbidden activities and art and youth things that uh, probably the generation of alex or youth people like Alex could do. And this is uh, what Manchester is, uh, is uh, giving, is offering, and this was very rich for us to do it, to, to film it. And um, yeah, it was a lot of fun to find out elements of the book in the city. What were the challenges of making this film? I, I know it went through various versions and different edits, and there were a lot of things that you had to uh, overcome to bring it together. Maybe you could tell us about some of those uh, challenges and, and difficulties that you'd overcome. I mean, we had animation. So the animation was already a big challenge because in terms of documentary, we had to give elements to prepare the animation in advance when the documentary was evolving and passages of the novel had to be picked up in advance. I mean, this is a bit technical. So without going into the technical, but let's say that the animation, plus the manuscript, plus getting the voice of Burgess, and of course the participants. I forgot Will Self, who is participating into the film, and brings also the voice of the writer, an unusual voice, I think. So if you put all that together, that's already a, quite a mix of elements which needs to follow. And of course, we didn't want any commentary in the film. So that meant that it had to keep a flow. And also Clockwork Orange, I think one of the debates was uh, we had the underground scene, we had the story of the film, uh, we had to say something about Burgess's life, which to talk about the contemporary element. I mean, it's a world, and Clockwork Orange is a world. And all this in less than an hour, because you were constrained by the, the particular series that this is a part of. Yeah, I have actually, I have to say that we have many regrets with uh, Elisa and with uh, Niels, the producer, because we really wanted to have the film a bit longer. <laughs> and uh, But as it is part of a collection, a film series, uh, we had to frame it in less than 60 minutes. But obviously, we really wanted to have some more details, like what has been the impact of the book on the underground culture, uh, especially on uh, and music culture at that time, but also uh, the generation after it, like uh, David Bowie has been inspired in its lyrics by the language of a Clockwork Orange, but also many, many other uh, music bands or musicians or uh, composers or poets. Andy Warhol has made a pirate film uh, out of uh, the book and we couldn't really use it because we didn't have the time to explore all these dimensions. I would say, yeah, it's a regret, but maybe next time we, we're going to make a, a longer version. I don't know. 
Elisa, now, this isn't the first Burgess film you've made. In 1997, you uh, directed another film um, in French and in English, um, and you worked on that project with Liana Burgess. And I wonder if you could tell us a little about your friendship with her. With Liana, how did the, all that develop? I guess when you work, I mean, my way of working personally is, of course, I go quite deep into the research, and that creates link, obviously, with key people. And I guess that's how our relationship started with Liana. We discussed Burgess. When I did the film, it was only uh, a few years after Anthony Burgess died. So she was the closest who could bring me who Burgess was. And... um, she opened, you know, the door of her house, and then we sort of became friends. You never know why uh, her relationship sort of de- develops. But it was key for me because I had also the understanding of who Burgess was through her. Of course, it was her view, but, you know, getting as close. And, of course, that meant also that Andrea the son uh, participated also in the film. I think that's the only interview. And Liana was a wonderful uh, character. She was, first of all, full of life and, you know, always oh, uh, ready to do something new. And she loved life. Looking at the film again, I suspect that Liana opened up her photograph collection to you, for example. Completely, because of the trust she gave me access to photographs, to material that... I mean, how did I discover the taxi driver, a witness from Malaya, somebody... You know, I got access to this kind of privilege access to people who were very close to Burgess and real witness uh, through Liana. You mentioned that you filmed what is, I think, the only interview with Andrew Burgess Wilson, Paolo Andrea, who's Liana's son. What do you remember about him? Well, it was something. I remember that it was touch and go to do the interview. And when finally Andrea decided that he was going to do it, was like Liana who told me, oh, Andrea is OK. That was a very emotional moment because you felt that it was so fragile You know, you had to be very careful of the way. But in fact, he was very direct. It's interesting. He was a very touching young man and very direct in his way. Mm. And, for example, in the film, when he talks about the autobiography, I didn't expect... And I think that's the quality of good, good interview is you don't expect the answer... When he says the autobiography, everything he says is true, but everything is false. And this is about the autobiography of Anthony Burgess. Everything uh, he says about me is true, but everything is false. And I thought, hmm, so interesting. And he really opened up through the interview with me. He was really happy to do it. He loved his father even if you could feel that the relationship was complex. And I think he was brought up with a lot of freedom. So when I say he was quite sharp, you could feel that he hadn't been told you should say this or that, or uh, not talking even about interview, but he was very free. But perhaps also not having the opportunity to talk so much about his father. What's next for you? Do you have a new project and plans for new films now that this one is is finished? Well, we have a new project with Benoit on uh, the Italian author Roberto Saviano, uh, a young author, well, not so young now, who has written a novel called Gomorra, and Gomorra is a novel about the mafia. And he's on the death threat from the mafia. Now, this novel, he wrote more than one novel afterwards. He's still alive, but under protection. And again, like in the case of Burgess, it's the second film because I already did one film with uh, Roberto Saviano. I have on my side a project uh, for the same collection, 
something about Machiavelli, Il Principe, the, the prince, and uh, maybe seen as a, uh, we are entering in election period, especially in the US and uh, all over the world. And I was curious to, I'm curious to see if we could use the prince as a reference to see the world of today. In terms of Burgess, the more you dig, the, the more you find, and you say we had debates, certainly debates about the meaning of uh, Clockwork Orange. But one thing for me was already that underground pop music scene, which really uh, sort of fascinates me, also because it's a paradox. Burgess was against pop music. And it's a pop music world, starting with the Rolling Stone and Mick Jagger, who was due to play Alex, who really takes uh, into 70s and Andy Warhol and all this, you know, who is deeply interested in Clockwork Orange. And they see it as a, they use it in their composition. And that goes, uh, we were talking early on, but with, uh, it carries on with David Bowie and, of course, groups like Toten Husen in Germany, uh, who are uh, kind of the rolling stone of the punk scene, German punk scene. Um, I like very much, I would very much like to go back on that uh, and do something about Clockwork Orange and the music and the pop music and the underground scene, yes. We'll look forward, of course, to your future work. Now, with this film, it's been released in uh, French and German. Yes. And I think there's a Spanish version, possibly um, Portuguese and Polish editions to follow. And it's looking for a UK and US distributor, if yes. I understand it rightly. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, it would be wonderful. I mean, uh, that it, you know, that the film found some uh, uh, distributor, uh, whether it's in Britain or in the States, yes. And we hope there'll be opportunities to see it in festivals around Europe. That would obviously be wonderful, yes. Yes. Uh, tonight is being the, 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 the premiere here, so the future and the life of the film starts. You've been listening to the International Anthony Burgess Foundation podcast. A Clockwork Orange, The Prophecy, is currently available in French, German and Spanish at Arte's website. Check out the direct links in the description of this episode. If you'd like to find out more about Anthony Burgess and the work of the Burgess Foundation, visit anthonyburgess.org. To keep up with announcements, events and other information, subscribe to our free newsletter at anthonyburgessfoundation.substack.com.